This is Boxes and Briefs, a podcast with real-life business stories. But we will be asking the hard questions and challenging traditions. So broaden your thinking with fresh perspectives and solve problems for business success. Welcome to another episode of Boxes and Briefs. My name's Lisa. I'm Lucy. And today we're joined by Teresa Martloper. How are you? I'm brilliant. How are you? Good, things. Oh, we look. Looking we... forward to this. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Let me introduce you. So, Teresa is a seasoned marketing strategist. That just sounds like you're old, but what it actually means is <laughs> you're very would say experienced I in what you do. <laughs> she specializes in helping small and medium-sized businesses cut through the noise and grow even with limited budgets. So, for those of you trying to figure out how to spend, where to spend, what to spend it on, listen up. She has experience across various industries in both New Zealand and Australia. And she focuses on empowering clients to make informed marketing decisions that actually connect with customers. Instead of just getting it done, there's a purpose to it. That's right. Love it. So tell us a bit about the Marketing Architect story, your business. Yeah, Marketing Architect kind of came about because I had, um, I I was in in in-house marketing for 20 odd years Mm -hmm. and I actually saw a gap in the market that there was very few strategically minded marketers that were supporting small and medium sized businesses to really achieve their goals. There's a lot of tactical marketers out there, but there's not that many strategic. And and really it was about trying to provide those, that really senior level strategic mindset, which is often seen in corporate environments, but not so much in small and medium sized businesses and making that available to the small and medium sized businesses at a, at a cost and, and in a structure that makes sense to them. Okay, Explain nice. to me the difference between strategic and tactic. Yeah, so a tactic is, is how, what most people see marketing as. So that's the things like your social media, like Google ads, advertising, all of those channels um, and, and activities that you undertake from a marketing perspective. The strategy is kind of the foundation that, that builds which tactics are the right tactics for you. It really makes sure that um, you've got the right things happening that will align with your goals, your business goals. Okay, right. So I do see a lot of businesses doing something that you mentioned to me earlier. Was it pray and, no, spray Spray. and pray. (laughs) Yeah. So just try everything and see what comes back. Hope, yeah. hope that something comes mm. back. That's right. It's exactly what, um, what what most businesses will be doing if they have not thought about marketing strategy or yeah. uh, considered a marketing strategy. And that they'll go, oh, well, it seems to make sense to me to do this. Yeah. Um, and, uh, you know, an example of that, I've had businesses come to me and go, oh, I've been spending $2,000 on... Um, Google ads and I just don't seem to be getting anything out of it or I don't know what I'm getting out of it. Yeah. Mm. They, they haven't seen any sales that are directly measurable against that. So um, it's really about going, well, is that the right thing for them to be doing? Um, because mm. there's some people out there that make decisions based on what's right for the business down the road, not yep. necessarily yeah. or what somebody told them they should be doing, <laughs> which isn't really yes. based around... Um, any kind of, um, or isn't based around what their business is. Well, I, I see your services as being a, um, there's a problem of guesswork in the middle, right? That's right, yeah. Some businesses will have sorted their business goals, where yes. they're trying to get five-year plan, one-year plan, whatever it is, they've got some goals. And then marketing has to happen, and you obviously want it to help achieve the goals, but I would say a lot of businesses guess. Yeah, they miss that step in the middle. Yeah. And and um, as marketers, we talk a lot around random acts of marketing. So if you don't <laughs> if you don't have a marketing strategy, which is pulling all of your marketing tactics together, yeah. and looking at how how is this a consolidated approach? How how are you leveraging off each other, and how are you making sure you're getting the biggest return you can? If you're not doing that, um, then most likely 
likely you are just doing random acts mm. and yeah. they are probably actually operating as silos. Yes. And, yeah, it, the, the, the more siloed act an activity is, the less likely it is to, to yeah. work. I see a lot of, like, there will be a business who goes, oh, we've got to do social media. And, well, you're good at Facebook, why don't you do it? And, oh, are you on Instagram? Maybe you could do our social media for us on Instagram. Yeah. But never the two shall talk. Yeah, that's <laughs> right. And, yeah. and and the same, you know, um, you might have a social media company doing posts or you're doing those inside mm -hmm. but internally, but then you've got somebody writing blogs for you mm -hmm. and those don't cross over. Mm -hmm. You know, content, um, one piece of content when it's generated, actually generates a whole lot more content than just one piece. Agree. And You're preaching to the <laughs> choir. <Yeah. laughs> and it's it's really like people just don't see it like that. Yeah. But if you sit down and you start planning this stuff out, that's actually what will happen is all mm. of a sudden you'll start leveraging everything to its maximum yep. yeah. and you'll be optimising the use of all of that activity across other activity mm, I'm reducing your workload that's right yeah. absolutely I mean it's it's all about efficiencies as well the the with smaller medium-sized businesses these two things that they have in uh, you know two limited resources time and money yeah mm -hmm. and 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 Lisa you mentioned the budget but it's not just about budget because with smaller medium-sized business businesses the business owner is often wearing so many hats that they're so time poor the last mm. thing they want is to be inefficient yeah so it's really super important that yeah. you know the, what they're doing is being as as efficient as possible by optimizing what's being done Actually analysing it, figuring mm. it out. I reckon you'd be the person to talk to, obviously, for that middle gap of guesswork, right? Yeah, it Do is. Do you often have to help businesses take that backward step to figure out their goals? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, I mean, majority of businesses I work with are already marketing, right? Yeah. And, yep. um, and so the question then I'm like, so if you're doing this, why are you doing that? And what what is that helping you solve? Like, what are the problems <laughs> that you've got? What is your direction as a business? What yep. goals are you wanting to achieve? And how do we make sure that the marketing is actually setting you in the right direction mm. to achieve those? Uh, it's not really just about doing some stuff to gain leads. You know, you want your business to be perceived in a certain way. Well, that means that you need to go about telling your story in that way and make sure that you're aligned uh, across all of your different activity yeah. uh, because misalignment in your messaging will actually often cause distrust with your customers. It will. It's, yeah. like, it's like a business being two-faced. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. You know, and authenticity today is key to any marketing. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Authenticity, I think, is the key to business in general. True. Yes. And, and where people struggle is taking the authenticity that they have themselves and then converting that and putting that into their marketing channels because you're taking what you know naturally to inside yourself yes. mm -hmm. and you're bearing that to the world mm -hmm. on social media and then how do you then convert that and put that onto your website? Mm -hmm. Like even scarier thought for a lot of people. <laughs> but it is, it's all about being genuine and the last thing that you want is something that's on your website or on your social media that you're, you're talking about that actually doesn't align with who you are mm. or what your values are. Truth. <laughs> Love it. Yeah. So then what are the common mistakes that you see business owners making in their strategy? Yeah, yeah. Look, other than not having a strategy. <laughs> Obviously, <laughs> yes. That, that mistake is made a lot. Um, there is probably a couple of other key ones. Um, one of those is really ensuring that there is KPIs and objectives in place mm -hmm. for each of your activity. So the activity that you are doing, every single piece, you should know what success looks like for it. Okay, so is that like going, all right, we're going to start a Facebook channel. Our goal is to have a million followers. <laughs> Like that's a goal, I guess it's a goal, yeah. but it's, it's not. The, it's not necessarily the type of goal that I would recommend to to somebody because the number of followers that you have does not actually convert into engagement or the fact that people actually are reading 
or listening or whatever it is that you're posting on your on your Facebook. Mm. Okay. So the kinds of measurements for social media is much more around engagement. Okay. Um, it's and 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 really, so it's about quality as opposed to quantity. Uh-huh. Um, Facebook's a perfect example, right? Where how many people that you personally follow um, actually pop up in your newsfeed anymore? There's very, very few. Yeah, so maybe true, yeah. you may be lucky if it's 10%, yep. probably 1% for a lot of people. Mm. And so um, just having people follow you is not is just not going to achieve anything for you anymore. You need to actually make sure that they're engaging with you regularly and that's how they pop up in your news feed. Yeah. Right. Okay, so the mistakes are not having a strategy. Yep. Not setting goals for each of your tactics. And... There's one that we discussed, it's got to be a little while ago now, um, the measurement. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like so People have things like Google Console, Google Analytics, even reports that they might get from their agency or their SEO guy or their Google Ads guy, right? But do you actually do anything with it? Yeah, I see that a lot. So a lot of um, businesses, um, I think I mentioned before that, you know, some businesses come to me and they're spending thousands of dollars on Google ads or digital marketing in general. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And and they just don't know what they're getting out of it. They can't track through the conversions. They don't know if they've had inquiries. They just really don't have any idea. And that normally comes about for a couple of reasons. One, they've never put any KPIs in place. Mm-hmm. They've never held their agency accountable mm-hmm. um, and generally that's because they're getting sent these reports via email and they don't know what they mean. Mm. Yeah, I've often, you know, we don't like jargon. We would rather it was explained and I think a really good piece of advice is if the, you don't understand it, you need to, even if it's just the surface level of understanding so that you can't have the wool pulled over your eyes. There's a lot of cowboys out there when it comes to SEO and analytics and AdWords and stuff. So it pays to understand just a little bit. Yeah. And that person should be able to explain it to you, right? Absolutely. And and this is, I think, there's a big gap out there that clients aren't asking their digital agencies to explain it and therefore yep. digital agencies aren't explaining it. Yeah. Mm. Um, they are getting, getting away, I guess, with some more of these sort of what we call vanity metrics, which is impressions and, right. and click-throughs as opposed to actual conversions yeah. and a conversion being like an inquiry effectively from your website. Yeah. Um, so they're getting away with looking at other metrics that actually aren't putting any money on the bottom line for the, for the client. Um, so it's super important that the client is actually going and asking the questions and going, well, what does this mean? Yeah. And if we're not getting the inquiries through the door, why? Yeah. Like, why? Is it, is it what can we do differently? That a business owner should be able to say, for every dollar I spend, I get this much back. Yeah, and that would be one of the KPIs, assuming that you can track your sales. Yeah. So when an Products inquiry comes is much in the door, than service, right? Absolutely. Yeah. If an uh, you know in a product in a product um, environment, it's really easy because normally the, the the inquiry comes in and and order will actually get raised yeah. and it can be tracked through that way. Um, when it comes to service-based, a lot of businesses don't have a tracking system in place. An inquiry will come in on their email mm-hmm. and um, the next piece of documentation that's kind of processed is an invoice. Yeah. <laughs> and so You have to ask that question, right? When it's service and you don't have any kind of call tracking or analytics that you're looking at on your website, you have to say, oh, so how did you hear about us? And that's how you track service. Yeah, and, and, you know, when you do get an inquiry through from a website, I mean, I'm a, I'm a massive advocate of, of CRM systems um, because CRM systems can play a role in this really well for you. So if you get an inquiry, you pop it into the CRM system in the inquiry stage and then as 
as that sale starts moving through, Mm -hmm. you actually start moving it through the different stages. So it might be it comes in as an inquiry, you have an initial meeting to qualify them, you qualify them, you might send a proposal out, and then you might have an additional meeting, and so you have all these stages in your sales pipeline, Mm -hmm. and you move them through. Now, a good CRM system is going to allow you to actually mark and note when your biggest conversion happens okay. from an inquiry to a sale. Mm-hmm. Or alternatively, when do they actually drop off the pipeline? When do yeah. they become a, not a sale? When do they actually turn around and say, no, nah, I'm not interested? Mm. Because normally if there's a lot ha- of that happening at one stage, there's something wrong with what you're doing in that stage. Yeah. yeah. So good. And so it's not just about, you know, marketing's not just about the leading coming in the door, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. which is what a lot of people perceive it as being. Well, it used to be that you'd have a marketing department and a sales department. Marketing would bring it in, sales would be in charge of mm. converting it. It's mm. not so like that anymore. It's no. very merged. Yeah, mm. yeah, and it should absolutely, like those two departments and a lot of businesses still are not aligned. Yeah. Um, but they absolutely should be because that's how you're going to get your best effective outcomes um, in a business if, you know, marketing are really supporting that sales process and the sales reps understand the marketing position and stuff like that of the business. Yeah. Well, I mean, we've been talking about people who can afford CRMs, who have got people who can put that information into the CRM. Let's bring it down to that small business where it might only be a one or a two-man band What kind of strategies can they use that will help them compete with companies that are so much bigger than them? Yeah, so I guess um, the the first thing you don't want to do is take them on head to head, right? So Mm -hmm. the the benefit of small businesses, well, there's there's lots of benefits of of small businesses um, that aren't there with large businesses, and part of that. is the agile nature of a small business. Um, So that's the first thing is that actually you've got the ability to shift and adapt so much faster than what you've got, uh, like what a big business has. So Mm. that's probably the first thing. Then um, secondly, it's really around like what's your niche? Because Mm. you don't, you know, you you don't have to be competing with a competitor right in the same space. So what is your niche? um, What's your point of difference in that niche? Yes. And make sure it's a real point of difference. Yes. (laughs) A lot of the time. We look after our customers. Yeah. We put our customers first. (laughs) Yeah. But I also see a lot of people going, oh, my point of difference is actually their strength. But it can also be a competitor's strength. Yes. Yes. Well, your point of so difference. It's not difference. Yeah, exactly. Your yeah. point of difference is only a point of difference if it's your strength and not your competitor's strength. Yeah. <laughs> and so making sure and, and actually analysing your competitors is, is important yeah. to understand okay. your true point of difference. Um, a novel idea, I know. But <laughs> <laughs> People just don't do it. No, that's right. And and it's because we, we've uh, kind of become... It's, it's quite typical of us to try and cut corners a lot of the time, but mm. it's actually about stepping back and going, okay, well, we we actually need to do this. It's a process. Yes. Uh, and, and so, yeah, understanding that point of difference and speaking to that point of difference to your niche, if you've got those things right, you understand yeah. the customer and you're speaking to their needs um, and you've got the true point of difference, all of that work That's is your strategy. Done. That's it. Mm. Yep. yep. Boxes and Briefs is proudly brought to you by Gilligan Shepherd, the problem solvers in business. Okay, Teresa, a big problem that comes up is trying to balance long-term, short-term. Yes, so we've got short-term marketing tactics, a little bit of prey and spray, with long-term brand building, that whole you know thing they talk about, about above the line, brand marketing that you can't measure. How do you balance it? Yeah, so I guess the short-term stuff really is often about lead generation. So you need to get the sales through the door right now. Yes. And um, and that's normal in any business, right? You absolutely have to have um, cash flow. So it's a given that short-term 
activity needs to happen. Mm -hmm. Um, The long-term brand building things can happen in a number of different ways. And so what I say to most businesses is dependent on on the size of your budget depends on what kind of activity you would undertake. If that means that you have to prioritise right now on short-term activity to bring leads through the door, then think about doing that with your brand in mind. So make sure that you're telling your brand stories still with all of those communications as well. Well, I would say a lot of businesses are experiencing feast or famine at the moment. So when it's feast, they're busy doing the work. Mm. When it's famine, that's when you want to bring in a short-term tactic to try and get the money in the door. That's right, yeah. So then when do you focus on brand? Yeah, so when when you're when you're in that stage where you're having the feast, that's definitely a oh, good time. Oh, when you have time. no time? Well, <laughs> this, is, this is where outsourcing can be a marvellous thing. Yeah. <laughs> and so um, the, probably the biggest, um, again, another mistake that I see businesses making is going, everything's rosy right now. Mm-hmm. Um, look at the construction industry a couple of years ago. Mm-hmm. And I was talking to every tradie and they're going, oh, no, I don't want to do any marketing because I've got like a year of work in my pipeline. Now what are they doing? They're all going, oh, where's the next next job coming from? Mm. So they should have been working on brand back then? Yeah, they should have been working on brand and and actually planning. That's, again, an ideal time for you to do marketing strategy as well is in that time when you actually have the money to spend on it um, in order to know that you're ready for these times. Yes, Um, because the ones who have planned and prepared for it are the ones who are going to survive. That's right. And you can't, you you know, marketing is not a silver bullet. A lot of people think you can just turn marketing on and people will walk through the door. No, no, it just doesn't happen like that. It does take some time. And so what having a marketing strategy ready um, and and having done all that preparation means that when you get to these tough times or when you see them starting to come, you can start turning the tap on. Yeah, right. Yeah. Okay then, so we've got a limited budget. What are some cost-effective marketing strategies for those with a limited budget? Yeah, so... Especially if they're trying to, like, survive right now. Yeah, yeah. I always um, suggest to people actually go back to your data and have a look at who is your most profitable segment? Segment, so, section, group segment, of people? Group of customers. Okay. Yeah, so so who is your most profitable group of customers? And then go out and target that group. And keep it very targeted. Do not go out to a broad industry. Um, how like do you target it? it, it and this is where strategy comes into it. it really depends on who that audience is but if is, I, is it like they all like surfing so I'm going to target surfing clubs is that kind of what you mean uh could be something like that it could be oh look we know that they're this type of people um if they like surfing and it's a b2c business probably social media and instagram and facebook and those sorts of channels are going to be appropriate um, if it's a if it's a B two B customer, it's probably more likely to be LinkedIn, um, right? But also talking to their needs and making sure that you've actually got the needs of that specific group right, and you're talking to those needs. That means that you'll be more relevant. Therefore, they're more likely to engage with you. Okay. Okay. That's that authentic thing if it's actually relevant and you're actually solving a problem for them. Mm. That's right. Yeah. yeah, yeah, but you have to tell them you're solving that problem for them, right? Yeah. <laughs> you know, marketing is not talking about your product or your service that you offer. It is actually talking to the customer about the emotion that they're feeling and the problem that they're having. Pain mm. points. That's exactly it. Yep. The pain <laughs> Sell points. Sell the solution, is that it? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and, then, and then, of course, that product or service is simply the conduit, that piece that moves them from or answers their need but moves them from that, that current state of, of anxiety or whatever worry or whatever it is that they're feeling to that amazing desired state where they feel so much better. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Amazing. Okay, future trends. What do you think we should be preparing for? 
Yeah, um, certainly like every industry, AI, you know, is going to continue to revolutionise the industry. It probably already has yeah. um, quite a bit. Um, if anybody in the marketing world is not utilising AI already, they certainly should start looking at it, investigate how that can help their business. Um, that's not to say that AI is advanced enough to do it all for you. Yeah. There still needs to be human intervention yeah. because uh, uh, an AI cannot feel human emotion. It cannot understand the intricacies of us as human beings. So what we do need to do is we need to take whatever comes out of that and actually, I guess, adapt it and... and um, Make it suit, make yeah. it suitable. Yeah. And I, I, I'm actually quite a big believer in the fact that there's going to become a whole AI industry where, and maybe one day there'll be a university course or something on it, where <laughs> literally you could study an AI and you'll come out as a, as a marketer that uses AI mm -hmm. to achieve everything. Okay. Um, and, and look, that probably applies to other industries as well. But understanding how you can prompt AI, how you can teach AI to learn about what you're doing is going to become integral to, to its use in the future. Yeah. And so that's what I think is the thing to look out for and probably going to be incredibly exciting and probably also incredibly nerve-wracking for a lot of people too. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean... I have noticed a massive upswing in digital marketing since COVID. Everybody yes. was stuck at home. The only way that businesses could get themselves out there was to do more socials or send emails that say, we're washing our hands three times as much as we were before. You can still expect great service from us. And then there was this, like, people got over it, unsubscribe, unsubscribe, unfollow, because they were over it. There's still that thing, though, that people, events still haven't picked up. It's still you're not really sure if people are actually going to turn up because there is definitely a more of a vibe of, oh, I don't feel like it anymore and just stay home, even if you've paid for a ticket to go to something. So do you see a swing happening towards more old school marketing, like print, promotional materials, stuff like that? I think that there's actually a bigger opportunity for a lot of businesses to be able to cut through in that space now because yes. there's less people doing it. Yes. Um, you know, one of the... One of the things I recommend to clients quite a bit is lumpy mail. I mean, back in my day, when I was younger, it was just called direct mail, but yeah. now it's lumpy mail. So oh. it's it's, um, <laughs> yeah, it's literally, and what lumpy mail is, is creating um, a, a product or something like that to send out to people and it gets delivered to their desk or to their okay. door. Um, and... and that, that's just so different from what, yes, yes, it can be more costly yeah. per item, yep. but it can actually have so much more cut through that yep. your, your effectiveness from it could, could be much higher than any digital campaign. It's almost like the old stuff is now disruptive marketing. Yeah, 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 in a way, <laughs> that's right. And, yeah. and I love to challenge um, people to go, because a lot of people, when they come to me, they're just like digital, that's all they have in their yes. mind. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and I'm like, no, 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 let's look at some of the other traditional things. Okay. Strategic partnerships, networking. Yeah. Huge. Huge. Because and of that authentic thing that's so strong nowadays. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Especially even when you were talking about the AI, it's almost like AI can make every business sound exactly the same. Yeah, it can. That's a problem. Exactly, yeah. yeah. And so if you, you actually don't know how to, how to be authentic or you're not telling anybody what your authentic message is, chances are as you then, like, if you don't know yourself, within yourself, yep. you're not going to be able to portray that in your marketing either. Yeah. Um, and that's what I find with networking. The more that you get out... Um, and network and talk to people, the more you actually develop your own authenticity and genuineness because you get um, better at telling your story. Yes. And the more that you do it and the more that you listen to other people, the more you actually learn about yourself as well. It's true. Yes, it's a journey. Yeah. Okay, so for all those businesses who are in the middle of guesswork or famine rather than feast, how do they get a hold of you? They can uh, check me out on my website, marketingarchitect.co.nz. Nice. Excellent. Thank you so much for your time. Thank, Thank you. you.
Boxes and Briefs is proudly brought to you by Gilligan Shepherd, the problem solvers in business.